Okay, thank you, Seth. Um, can people hear me? That's okay. All right, I tend to move around. I don't know how good an idea this is, but um, okay. Uh, last night, the last speaker said that there's no sure way to kill the discussion than to start by saying, let me explain the science. <laughs> That's our responsibility in this panel is to explain the science. And so, you know, I hope you don't all walk out at this point. Um, for some reason, that's regarded as a killer because it's supposed to mean that you're about to reduce the whole argument to unfathomable complexity and with no clear decision in mind. And I don't think that's the case. I think the science is very clear if people could only see the actual data. A lot of the arguments that we hear about global warming and the solutions, a lot of this is smoke and mirrors largely because people haven't looked at the data. If you look at the data graphically, I think it's very clear. So I want to show some scientific information here and um, relating to global warming and uh, why it's worse than people think and what we can do about it. But basically, the solution is a down-to-earth solution. We need to take the CO2 in the atmosphere using trees, pull it out of the atmosphere, and put it, put it back in the ground where it belongs and where it'll do the most good. Mm. Now, why is this not working? Okay. Use this one instead? Okay. Okay. All right, so um, what we call this, we call this geotherapy. This is a deliberate medical analog in which in order to do, solve the problem, we need to first correctly diagnose what the problem is um, and prescribe a corrective course of action in order to restore stability to the system that we have disturbed. This is the last 11,300 years of global temperature in blue, and those are the actual measurements. It's been pretty stable. And the red is the IPCC projections of what's about to happen. Um, and as I will show you in a minute, that's a very serious underestimate. Now, in fact, we're facing runaway global climate change at the present time. And the thing is, simply reducing emissions alone cannot possibly prevent the runaway. There's the excess CO2 that is in the atmosphere will continue to have effects for thousands of years, even if we stop all fossil fuel use today. So there's a very serious problem. We are committed to large amounts of global warming that are, are being ignored because of the long time scale. Geoengineering is unproven, probably won't work, is going to cost a large amount, and has very dangerous side effects that are probably worse than the problem it solves, and they're temporary at best. So the best way we know of to remove CO2 is to use the biosphere, to use the plants to remove the CO2, and put it in the soils. And that, that's the answer. It's just, where can we put it? In the soils. What is the safe CO2 level? 260 ppm, not 350. I'll show you how we come to that in a minute. And how fast can we remove it? We could do it in decades if we were serious about it. <clears throat> okay, the concept of geotherapy was developed in 1990 by Richard Grantham, and his notion was that we needed to do what a doctor does, correctly diagnose the cause of the illness and prescribe a course of action that will bring the patient back to, to good health. Um, so that concept has been around for a long time. This just shows what IPCC projects is going to happen. Now, if we take a look at CO2 emissions, we only have about 100 years or so of CO2 in the ground at the rate we're going to use it up. If we dig up and burn all the coal and petroleum and natural gas, we'll use it all up fairly quickly. So this, this shows the next thousand years of what would happen. Eventually, you run out of CO2, so emissions have to drop. Okay, unfortunately, the, the large amount of fracking and natural gas is extending that, and it's going to make the problem even worse. But the point is, CO2 concentration will rise for about a, a couple hundred years, but then it will level off because there won't be more than we can put in. But that excess CO2 is going to take a, thousands of years to work its way out of the system because the carbon cycle has two main components, what we call the fast component that we're going to talk about, which is mainly the biological cycle, but also the long-term component, which is the geological cycle of CO2, and that takes millions of years to restabilize CO2 once it's perturbed. So that's why CO2 in this figure just keeps on going. Uh, oops, the pointer's not working here. Out, out here. Okay, and, and global temperature will rise, and it will stay high for thousands of years as a result of that high CO2. Thousands of years. And you can see temperature levels off. It doesn't even begin to come down after a thousand years. Then as temperature warms up, the ocean expands. So here's the expansion of the, the sea due to 
increased temperature. And then ice cap melting kicks in. And you can see the rise in sea level here, a thousand years, isn't even beginning to level off. That's going to continue for maybe another 5,000 or more years of sea level rise. And all of this, you know, we've already set into motion, even if we never use any more fossil fuels beginning today. So the, the impacts are much larger than IPCC projects. And the thing is that IPCC had a politically motivated mandate to use models to project what would happen in the next five years, 10 years, 20 years, maybe 50 years, perhaps 100, because no politician cares about what happens 5,000 years from now. So their projections were to only give less than 10% of the, the effects, because those will continue for much longer than 100 years, and humanity will have to pay that price, or the, the Earth will. So it's much more serious than they say. Uh, when IPCC made their first projections, I went and compared the sensitivity of their models to the actual climate change record. And what you see here on the left is IPCC's projection of the change in global temperature per unit change in CO2. That's on the left, the small bar. And on the right is what the actual climate data says. The actual climate data, the long-term climate data, suggests the global average change in temperature per unit change of CO2 is 10 times greater than IPCC projections indicate. The sea level change per unit temperature is about 100 times greater than IPCC projects, and the sea level change per unit change in CO2 is about 1,000 times greater than the IPCC projections. They were only measuring the very short-term beginning of the response, not the entire thing, and it's very misleading for that reason. So this is a graph that I published in 1990 comparing from the ice core, uh, Antarctic ice core records, global CO2 versus temperature, and that's this line here. These are the IPCC projections. As you can see, they're not even close to fitting the data, and this, the change in temperature that they predicted for doubling of CO2 is only a tiny fraction of what the data indicates. The data indicates that but if you go up to about 400 ppm, you'll be up at close to 20 degrees C warmer than today much larger than IPCC projects. Now, I published that back in 1990, and it was ignored for obvious reasons at the time. No one wanted to hear that IPCC had underestimated the impacts. Everyone was complaining that they must have overestimated them. And now there's a lot more data. This is based on 800,000 years of climate change data by Rowling. He never saw my original paper, but his results are identical, except that he plotted CO2 against temperature, whereas I plotted the other way around. But in fact, our uh, and he has a lot more data, as you can see, but our, our graphs exactly overlie each other. And once again, he's, he's compared here global CO2 versus temperature and then global sea level versus temperature. Now, this, this is how the Earth ecosystem or climate system actually behaves. This is the real data. It's not based on models. This is a reality-based estimate. And what I will do now is show you how we can use these data to determine what the safe level of CO2 is. And that here is shown here. Blue is safe and red is dangerous. Now, if we take a look at today's level of CO2, which is 400 ppm, the equilibrium temperature, the steady state temperature for that level of CO2 is about 17 degrees Celsius higher than today's temperature. That's what it would ultimately rise to if it stabilizes that level of CO2. 17 degrees C, not one or two degrees C that IPCC projects. It's 10 times worse. And the equilibrium sea level for today's level of CO2 is about 23 meters, or about 75 feet above today's level, not 10 centimeters or 50 centimeters like IPCC is projecting, because a steady state response will take thousands of years. And it's important to realize that the climate system has a built-in 1,000-year time lag. When we increase CO2 now and it absorbs heat in the atmosphere, that goes into the deep sea. The deep sea holds 90 to 95 percent of the Earth's heat. The atmosphere doesn't. It doesn't build up in the atmosphere until the sea is warmed up. And it takes a thousand years for the ocean to turn over. So until the deep sea warms up, we won't feel the full effect of warming at the surface of the Earth. There's a 1,000 year time lag built into the system. So, and this, this, these curves that we're showing here take that into account. We're looking at the long-term responses. So it's much more alarming than IPCC suggests. I mean, it's a, it's a real doom and gloom scenario, and we're headed for that even if we never burn any more coal and oil beginning today. Is that, that's what we're headed for. <laughs>
Uh, this shows the heat building up in the deep sea. Everyone, the, you know, the right wing and the religious fanatic are saying, oh, there's no global warming. The surface temperature isn't rising. It's building up in the deep ocean. The deep ocean's been refrigerated. It's just above freezing because it cooled off at the poles and sank. Until that warms up, we won't feel the full effect here. This is a place in my, my home island of Jamaica, and here we can see the past, present, and future. This today's sea level. This is the sea level 130,000 years ago, the last warm interglacial period before the present one. And the sea level here was about 25 feet above today's level, six, seven meters or more above today's sea level. This is today's ocean. In those days, it was up here. Now, at that time, at that time, probably all the coral reefs in the equatorial zones died from high temperatures. If we look at the fossil reef in front of it, well, I'll show you that in a second, um, it, it indicates that. Now, at the time that this sea level formed, global temperatures were about one or two degrees C warmer than they are today. CO2 levels were about 280 parts per million. They're 400 ppm right now, today. At this point, it was 280 parts per million. And there were hippopotamuses and crocodiles in London, England. London, England was a tropical swamp at that time. Um, and that was for 280 parts per million. For 400 ppm, the equilibrium sea level is 75 feet up, up the cliff. Okay? So here, we, if we know what we're looking for, we can see the past, the present, and the future in one, one location. <clears throat> That's a geological cross-section of the area. And what you see is today's modern reef, now dead from high temperatures, Today's sea level, and there's this fossil reef sitting up here with the fossil sea level up above it. During the ice ages, sea levels were down here. And before the glacial period, their old fossil sea level notches way up on the cliff, 75, 100 feet up. That's before the, we went into the glacial period. So that, that's, if we melt all the ice caps, sea level is going to go to some, something like that. <clears throat> this shows the last 800,000 years of CO2. And at the time that that sea level, 25 feet above today's level formed, we had about 270, 280 parts per million of CO2. Now we're up here at 400. Now these are some projections of sea level rise for a 1, 2, and 3, or 4 degrees C rise in, in sea level. And uh, you know, for 4 degrees C, you're talking about something like close to to 10 meters rise in sea level. This is only after 5,000 years. This isn't even the full response. This is a model-based estimate. So that means flooding of all low-lying coastal areas. It's much more serious than IPCC has told us. Now, many years ago, back in the 1980s, I was doing a lot of work on CO2 cycling in Amazonian rainforests, and we realized that, that the way to get rid of the excess CO2 was to store it in the tropical vegetation and soils. So, Instead of cutting down the trees and putting their CO2 into the atmosphere, we should be plant paying people to plant trees back in degraded lands and absorb that CO2. And we proposed at that point the idea of a carbon tax in which everyone who, in which the polluter pays. Whoever puts CO2 into the atmosphere pays whoever removes it and puts it into the ground or vegetation. And Norman Myers and I published a paper in which we tried to calculate what that cost would be for a carbon tax that really solved the problem by through reforestation of degraded lands. And we found that there was enough abandoned, degraded forest land in Brazil alone to absorb the CO2. This was land where the forest had been cut down, the soil had been ruined, and that people had simply abandoned it and left it to weeds. There was enough land there alone. And it would, would have cost, we thought, something like two or three dollars per person per year for the real cost of removing their CO2. Worldwide, about two or three. For the US, it would be about 10 or 15 or $20 per year per person. But the cost was, in fact, very low with very high benefits, as long as a carbon tax went directly from the producer of CO2 to the consumer of CO2. So it seemed pretty simple, we thought. Um, for some reason, people didn't pay attention. And uh, we concluded large-scale environmental restoration was the only way to stabilize CO2 at safe levels. The notion of a carbon tax later became picked up by economists and politicians. They meant something totally different than what we meant by a green carbon tax. What they meant in the economist's language is to make energy so expensive that people couldn't afford to use it. So what they ask is, what is, is a punitive tax that we need to charge energy to reduce consumption? And because people will drive their cars in Los Angeles even when the, the gas costs $100 a gallon, 
It means it's very, you need very brutally high taxes in order to reduce consumption to the appropriate level. So it's a very expensive solution. It's the most expensive possible solution. And worst of all, politicians and governments think that's free money for them to spend on whatever they want without solving the problem. So not only would it be expensive, it wouldn't remove the CO2. I mean, it seems to us to make no sense at all. And that's why carbon taxes have got such a bad name. This shows the carbon market in in uh, Europe, it's collapsed because what they did is they passed out permits to all the biggest polluters for free, and they passed out permits to produce more CO2 than the worst polluters could produce. So the price of the carbon collapsed, and essentially, the carbon market in Europe makes the cost of pollution essentially free. It's an encouragement to pollute. It's not, a, not an incentive to recycle the carbon at all. And the U.S. doesn't even have a carbon tax. So the whole notion of what economists and politicians have proposed with carbon tax have got a very bad name, and uh, we think they don't solve the problem. Well, this is what Peter Tosh said. You can run, but you can't hide. When you run to the rock, the rock will be melting. When you run to the sea, the sea will be boiling. Where are you going to run to? Well, that's what they've got us heading for right now. It's the politicians' proposals are going to at best reduce CO2 emissions from this to this, and they're only going to marginally slow down the increase. We have to remove the CO2. We need to take a, a sink side approach. Large-scale environmental restoration is the only way we can do that. I mean, we're not saying we, we don't need to reduce emissions. Of course we need to, but we need to start putting the carbon back in the ground where it came from. This is a map of global soil carbon. There's about five and a half times more carbon in the soil than there is in the atmosphere or in the vegetation. And almost all of the carbon in the soil is very degraded. We've mismanaged almost all of that. We've put about half of that carbon that was in that soil into the atmosphere by mismanagement. We've oxidized the carbon instead of building it up. And so, in fact, most of the world has badly degraded soils. All of these areas are desperately in need of restoration and increased soil carbon. These are areas where forests need to be replanted for various reasons. Agricultural lands need to be upgraded. So we're talking about most of the earth is in a situation that it needs more carbon for purely local reasons. Well, that's a carbon cycle. Well, this, this is where I try to explain the science and it gets very complicated. So let me show you a simpler version of the carbon cycle. In the center here is what we've done. These are the anthropogenic sources of CO2 that have destabilized the system. Naturally, there are two main components to the carbon cycle, the exchange of CO2 with the ocean back and forth, and that's a very large flux. And then with the terrestrial vegetation, which is even bigger, photosynthesis absorbs much more CO2 than fossil fuels produce, but it all gets recycled back to the atmosphere very quickly, either through respiration or decomposition in soils. So what we need to do now is essentially find a way to reduce this decomposition and put it into the soil organic carbon. That's, that's the trick. We can't control the oceans because we can't control the winds and waves. There's no practical prospect of removing CO2 in the oceans. Land is the only place where we can do it effectively. And this is what we need to do. This graph here shows the amount of carbon in the atmosphere, and the red is a dangerous excess so we need to get rid of. We need to pull that out of the atmosphere to get down to safe levels of CO2 that don't perturb the system unduly. And that means getting this large amount of excess carbon sucked up into trees, into the vegetation, and then into the soil. And we only need to increase the amount of carbon in the soil about 10% worldwide to absorb all the excess CO2. I think that's doable. I mean, as, as you'll see, many people here have presented results in which they show they can greatly increase the amount of carbon in soil. There's about six or 10 different methods that do that. Um, here now, what I've done is I've plotted all the major carbon sources and sinks as a function of the percent of carbon in the atmosphere that's recycled every year versus the time it takes to recycle. Photosynthesis over here is actually recycling all of the CO2 in the atmosphere on a time scale of about six years. Okay? So all the CO2 in the atmosphere gets pulled down into photosynthesis in about six years. It gets recycled back through respiration and decomposition in, in a similar time scale, but in fact, if we manage photosynthesis in a way to put the carbon into the soil instead of burning it back off, we can pull down the excess CO2 in the order of decades, depending on how efficiently we remove and store that carbon. Um, 
this shows the productivity of forests as a function of, of sunshine. And it's interesting because the tropical forests have much higher photosynthesis, but they also have much higher respiration. And so therefore, they're very inefficient at holding on to their carbon. They burn off about 80% of their carbon. Cold forests, on the other hand, hold on to about 70% of their carbon because respiration is low. So we need to restore cold forests in order to hold on to carbon, and we need to restore warm forests because they cycle CO2 very quickly and reduce the lifetime of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Uh, these are some measurements of CO2 from Hubbard Brook and from Amazonian rainforests. Now let me show you here what happened. When we cut down the Amazon rainforests, everyone would have thought that CO2 would have increased the flux out of the soil into the atmosphere because of all the dead organic matter. In fact, when you cut down Amazonian rainforests, what we found is the CO2 released from the soil collapsed. And that's because almost all the CO2 did not come from the decomposition of dead organic matter came from the respiration of the living plants and roots and the fungi and insects that depend on the living plants. And so when we, we deforest the system and go to bare soil, the CO2 production collapses. When you let it regrow to weeds, it doesn't come up very much. Cattle pasture more, grasslands more. And in the case of Floresta de Tijuca, which I showed you last night, it's back up at Amazonian levels. So these different forms of management here that remove carbon, the ones that store carbon back in the system result in a sort of recovery. So we're, we're able to map out areas that restore the CO2. Now, the Amazon has the best solution of all. This is developed by Amazonian Indians five or 10,000 years ago. This is Terra Preta do Indio in Portuguese, or the Black Earth of the Indians, now called biochar. All along the banks of the Amazon are these black soils that are about 10% carbon by weight, because in ancient times, the Indians of the Amazon discovered they could make charcoal instead of burning it and putting the CO2 in the ground, into the atmosphere, they put it back into the ground. These are the most fertile soils in the world. That carbon doesn't decompose, it holds on to water, it holds on to nutrients. You can plant these, these soils year after year without adding fertilizer. You go one mile in land, you produce one crop of corn, you burn the fertility of the soil out forever. So they developed the solution thousands of years ago, to, their knowledge was lost to genocide from European diseases 500 years ago. We've only learned how to regain it. But of all the forms of carbon that we can put in the soil, this lasts forever. And so this is something that we have to be doing on a very, very large scale. It's the only way we can do it, is to greatly restore our ecosystems in ways that store the carbon and produce bio-negative, carbon-negative energy. We'll hear a lot more about how to do that from other speakers here. Well, the key point is we know how to do it. We know how to grow our way out of the carbon crisis if we only use what we know and put the soil back into the ground. World Soil Day is coming up, December 5th. Next year is the FAO International Year of the Soil. It's also the year that we have to get governments to agree for the first time to recognize that soil carbon is a carbon sink. The UN Framework Convention on Climate Change does not recognize soil as a carbon sink even though it has about six times more carbon than the atmosphere. So you can't get carbon credits for putting carbon in the soil and doing the right thing. It's not even legal to do that by the UN uh, Convention. So that, that's something we need to change. And I'll just say, I'll, I'll, in closing here, that in a, in a week or two, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change is meeting in Lima, Peru, we're going to try to put this issue in front of them to say we have to restore soils and ecosystems. That has to be the focus of our climate change efforts if we want them to be able to work instead of doing what they're talking about now, which is emissions reductions that aren't going to make any real difference at all. Thank you. <clears throat>